So this point's quite an important point, this elastic limit. Something happens to the material at the elastic limit. And it's happening on an atomic scale. So during this part of the stretching, all that's happening is that the atomic bonds that are holding the atoms together in the material, the bonds are just stretching. Or actually, the same thing happens when you compress objects as well. So this could be um, a, a, a compressing of the material rather than a stretching of the material. But the point is, all that we're doing is flexing the atomic bonds. And as the atomic bonds flex, uh, the atoms will either get a little bit further apart from each other, or they'll get a little bit closer together. But either way, when we take away the force, the atoms just revert back to their equilibrium positions, their bonds go back to their original lengths, and the object goes back to the size that it was. And because of the way that the atomic bonds work, applying twice as much force results in the bond stretching by twice the amount. And so this direct proportionality here um, is a direct res uh, response to the behavior of the atomic bonds on a molecular scale. So that's what we mean by elastic, that we've got this this proportionality here it's due to the atomic bonds stretching or shrinking and that when the force is removed equilibrium is once again restored that's why it's reversible and only temporary but those bonds can only stretch by so much <coughs> and at some point we will get to the point where the the external force that we are applying to the material actually succeeds in breaking some of the atomic bonds that are holding uh, the material together at a molecular scale. And when that happens, the atoms inside the material will actually rearrange permanently. Um, in a metal like the spring that we were dealing with, uh, the atoms tend to be arranged in a big superstructure called a metal lattice. And what you often find happens is that an entire plane of the lattice, so an entire sheet of atoms, slides over the sheet below it, meaning that the material permanently extends in length because a whole section of it just moved further along the object on a macroscopic scale. And that means that the object is now permanently deformed. When we relax the force, those atoms are not going to go back to where they came from. They've settled in a new equilibrium position and they have forged new bonds with the new atoms that they've come to lie next to. And so the Deformation now is a permanent one. Those atoms are permanently in a new position, and we can't reverse that. We refer to this permanent deformation as a plastic deformation. So elastic when it's temporary and reversible, plastic when it's permanent and ir irreversible. The actual atoms have moved. They've changed position, and they're now somewhere else. I'm assuming that you've written that down while I've been talking. I need my graph back. So I've got my graph working now. OK, so. Oh, brilliant. Do you want to flash it up at the screen? Let me see. Oh, nice, Henry. Although. Uh, there is a small tweak that I would suggest you make based on the lack of data that you've got on the unloading. Um, you'll see why in a second. That's a nice graph. Well done. <laughs> 
it's a panic because of spring has started stretching quite okay. a lot yeah yeah you worried it was going to go okay so you stretched your string your spring until it permanently deformed what somebody did depending on how brave you were feeling um and then you stopped at some point so you could have carried on and this graph would have carried on getting longer and longer and longer uh until eventually you'd have snapped the thing or something but at some you decided to stop at some point and then you started to um unload it again now two things happened during the unloading the first was that it started to come back on a kind of curving shape that's not curving enough so you should have got a kind of curve going on <coughs> for the first bit of the unloading and that's because when this elastic limit was reached and the material permanently deformed it settled into a new position and then before the next lot of permanent deformation took place it continued to um, do the hook's law thing a little bit um, so you will have found that there will have been a slight undoing of the permanent deformation. So it, it did uh, come back in a similar trajectory to this one-ish. But then at some point, it will have then come back down here. And that's the bit that you've got slightly differently, Henry. This bit here, again, will be a direct proportionality. And the reason for that is, um, it'll be somewhere around there again. The reason for that is that when the atoms settle back into a new permanent arrangement, they're going to form bonds pretty much like the bonds they had in the first place. If you imagine that a lattice looks like a whole load of atoms that are sitting on top of each other, and that for elastic deformation, we just get a slight stretching of the bonds so that the layer on top just moves slightly to the side so that the length of the material gets slightly longer than it was. That's your elastic deformation. But then when we move on to plastic deformation, you find that this whole layer of atoms all shifts up a little bit, which means that you end up with a permanent shift and a permanent extension now. But the bonds are the same as they were before because these atoms that have shifted are still sitting on identical atoms that they, uh, they, that they were bonded to before. It's just different identical atoms. So these bonds are the same. And so they're still able to flex a little bit like they did in the first place and so you do get the same um elastic deformation beneath the force at which deformation is occurring and therefore what you should have found when you did your experiment and some of you have because i've seen it is that this line here this unloading line it has the same gradient for springs anyway as this loading line but there will be some curving at the top to represent the permanent deformation that's taken place <coughs> okay so i'll give you a second to uh check your graph and add the point that we have got uh, the same Right, I've written f is proportional to x. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just tweak that to same gradient. Uh, why can't I write f proportional to x? Why was that incorrect? A bit sloppy. Because it's, it's like x plus c. Yeah, it's like a constant. You're right. It needs to go through the origin not not this point here yeah good okay so this difference here at the bottom this is the permanent extension of the string permanent extension 
or, or sometimes called permanent deformation. So you should have found that when you'd finished unloading your spring it and, and it, you dismantled all your equipment, that the spring no longer looked like it did uh, originally because it's now permanently stretched. We should lock down some words, actually, while I'm thinking about it. Um, let me just give you a little vocabulary that we just need to um, make sure we know. Uh, we've got a whole load of words that begin with tense. So tension is uh, a pulling force. So just make sure you are happy with what tension is, a pulling force. That's the word we use for it. Um, and so we sometimes refer to these as rather than tensions, sometimes we refer to them as tensile forces. And when, when tensions or, or tensile forces produce deformations, we often refer to them as tensile forces deformations. On the other hand, we can have compression. And when you compare these two, you can see how the English language has di uh, diverged. So um, we tend not to refer to the word compression as the name of a force, <coughs> we would usually say compressive forces. But for some reason, we've adopted the word tension, which is more a description of what's going on, that an object is under tension, an object is under compression. Um, we tend to say compressive forces, but we've just used the word tension as the name of a force. Um, rather than, I suppose, more, more accurately, we should say tensile forces. And then if you've got compressive forces that deform an object, we often refer to these as compressive deformations. So those aren't particularly things that you need to, you know, make really solid notes about or anything like that. I just realized that I'm using all these words um, when we're talking about what's happening to the spring. And I was conscious that I hadn't actually checked that you were clear on what I meant by them. Okay, back to the matter at hand. Hello, Max. I've recorded the first half of this lesson, so uh, you can watch it back uh, later on. Oh, he's gone again. Oh, no, he's not. There we go. Okay, so... Um, let's visit this little part of the graph now. This f is proportional to x bit because that's the bit that i want you to remind you about but i'm just going to update it ever so slightly for the a level so again let me just clear my graph area okay so this part of the graph is referred to uh, as the hooke's law region sometimes uh, the elastic region, the uh, region of proportionality. But at A level, uh, your examiner favors the term Hooke's law region. So we, we should probably use that one. And we've already spoken about 
uh, the properties of, of this region. So I'm not going to repeat that again. But the reason that it's called Hooke's Law, uh, the Hooke's Law region, is because um, this force law is known as Hooke's Law. And you studied that at GCSE. So that should be familiar to you. And basically, it just formalizes in an equation what we have said in words that this elastic region involves a direct proportionality. It's a constant gradient through the origin. And the gradient of that line is k. It's, uh, so that's the gradient of the graph. And the gradient of this graph is known as the force constant. You don't need to read anything into that name. <laughs> Excuse me. It's just something that we can refer to the constant by. So the force constant. And you can see that the physical um, interpretation of the spring is the force that is required to make the extension be one. So whatever force it is that causes an extension of one, a unit extension, uh, is k. F will equal k times one. So k is the force required for unit extension. And given we usually work in uh, newtons per meters, so usually that's our unit of choice. So that would mean it's a unit extension for one meter. However, we don't have to work in newtons per meter. Um, for the springs that you were using, you were measuring x in centimeters, I imagine. And so when you do Newtons divided by extension, you're going to force divided by extension, you're going to do Newtons divided by centimeters. And your gradient is going to come out in Newtons per centimeter rather than Newtons per meter. And it makes much more sense to use the most appropriate unit. So although we have a slight preference for Newtons per meter because it's technically the official SI unit, Newtons per centimeter is common as well. Could you please bang out onto the chat what your gradient of your graph was? You should have worked that out. I just want to check if they're all similar. Just pop it on the chat now. 0.2-ish. You can do better than that, Saskia. It is 0.2-ish, but yeah, you, you, you can get me another decimal place. Come on, Henry. Seriously, one decimal place? Zach's gone for three. A little bit too many for the, the squares on your graph paper, I imagine. <clears throat> okay, this is very good. So, um, yeah, any values between 0.2 and 0.25 um, are acceptable for this. Yeah, thank you, Saskia. So, the spring sold to us by the manufacturer, it is supposed to have a spring constant of 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.24, 0 0.25. That's, that's what they say it's got a spring constant for, um, but there will be manufacturing variabilities. Plus, you were measuring this using a bottle of water. Um, and a tape measure. So um, yeah, anything between 0 0.20 and 0 0.25 is bang on the money. So well done. That's very good. Okay, so apart from possibly the, the, the name force constant, which I don't think we really emphasize too much at GCSE. In fact, at GCSE, we tend to call it the spring constant. Um, apart from that, this bit is just out of GCSE. So the A-level bit has been the commentary about uh, the language that we're using and the reason for permanent deformation, but the plastic region of the graph. That's been the, the A-level learning so far. However, we are now going to extend Hooke's Law into a little bit of A-level. So let me just rub this off. Okay, so let's have a little think about Hooke's Law. 
So what we like to do at A-level, as well as teach you specific bits of physics, we like to take every opportunity we can to reveal to you the holistic nature of physics. Holistic means considering everything all at the same time. And what we have discovered uh, in our journey through physics over the last four or 500 years since, since we started studying uh, the physical world is that the same ideas keep cropping up in completely separate domains of physics, that you'll be studying one thing one, one, one place and you'll discover something. And then somebody somewhere else will be investigating a completely unrelated phenomenon that has nothing to do with, with the one you're, you're studying. And yet they have exactly the same um, mathematical consequences afterwards. Give me one second. Okay, so um, let's let, have a little look at Hooke's Law and be delighted to discover that it has something in common with a completely different area of physics. So yeah, we're going to be talking about springs, but that's not the point. The point is to reveal uh, that physics is deep down fundamentally interconnected. And what we're going to have a look at are... Um, <coughs> some springs that we're going to hang together in parallel. So what that means is that I'm going to hang a spring off something uh, <clears throat> and then hang another spring off something right next to it. So they're in parallel. And then I'm going to join them together at the bottom as well. And I'm going to pull them down with a force F. And they're going to extend by a distance x from their original length. So uh, these don't have to be the same springs. Um, so this can be k1 and this can be k2. They can have completely different uh, spring constants. Um, but they were originally this length and now they're this length. Uh, so they got the same extension and the same force. And I'm going to ask, how does that compare to, again, a third spring that has a spring constant we'll just call K. And again, this third spring has been pulled down with exactly the same force F, and it has extended exactly the same distance X. So how do two springs form um, the same job as one spring. So imagine that I have got a machine and I am um, just some bit of the machine gets pulled out. I don't know, maybe it's like a machine at the gym and some uh, customer has come along and they're pulling on the handle of the machine and I want them to have to pull with a certain force so they get a good workout. Um, but, you know, the machine's only so big, the, the person can only move their body so far while remaining in the seat. So my question is, you know, I, I want the machine handle to move a distance X, and I want the, the person who's doing the workout to be pulling on it with a force F. Um, but do I have to go and find myself a single spring to do this? Or could I make do with a couple of springs that I've got lying around that I could use in parallel with each other? So the question is, you know, what pair of springs perform exactly the same function as this single spring? Well, uh, you can see that uh, here on the single spring one, this bar is being pulled down with a force F, and it's being pulled up with the Hooke's law force, uh, which is K times X. We've pulled the spring down, so it must be equal to KX. That's what we have just said, that when you extend a spring, the force you're extending it with is equal to this K times X, that's Hooke's law. That's what we've just found out. 
And the bar is in equilibrium. It's neither accelerating downwards or upwards because the bar is pulling back with exactly the same force, which is the Hooke's law force. Now for this force over here, this spring must be being pulled downwards by a force uh, k1 times x, because that's the force that's required to extend this spring by a distance x. That's Hooke's Law's force. And equally, uh, there must be the same force pulling back from the spring, otherwise the spring wouldn't be in equilibrium. Likewise here, this spring must be being pulled down by k2 times x because that's the rule of Hooke's law. That's saying that when this spring has been extended a distance x, the force that extended it was k2 times x. And again, equally, because the bar is in equilibrium, oops, that's a two, there must be the same force pulling upwards as well. But this is the bit we're interested in here. The total downward force, which is F, is k1 x plus k2 x. But we said before that these two forces were the same. So if it's equal to k1x and k2x, and it's equal to kx, then that means that we can write that kx equals k1x plus k2x, that this equals this. But we also said that the extensions were the same. So the x's cancel out until we're left with the formula that k equals k1 plus k2. That is that the spring constants are summative. They add up when the springs are in parallel. Okay, I need you to park that thought for a minute. <coughs> and we need to instead um, have a little think about springs in series instead. So let me just grab another board. Okay, springs in series then. So let's let's start by redrawing the original picture that we've just had. A single spring being pulled down with a force F, which is equal to KX, where here's the extension X and it's a spring constant of k. So that's the picture that I just had for one single spring. Now, instead of taking two springs and joining them side by side in parallel to each other, let's have them in series, which means that I have one spring, and then I join it up to the next spring, one after the other in series. Struggling to draw it the right then. And again, I'm going to pull it down with exactly the same force as before. And I'm going to make sure that the whole contraption stretches the same distance x. Now, last time we said that the force was the same and the extension was the same. But that's not necessarily true this time. In the first picture, these two springs had to stretch by the same amount because they're side by side, they move the same distance. But in this picture, this spring at the top might have stretched by 
I don't know, x1. And the spring at the bottom might have stretched by x2. And together, x1 plus x2 are adding up to the total extension of the spring. Each spring can stretch by a different amount now. And what's going on with the forces? Okay, well, here's where your training from the forces topic comes in. And we're going to consider just this bar here. This bar is in equilibrium, which means that the force pulling up on the bar is the same as the force pulling down on the bar. But the force pulling up on the bar is just the force that stretched this one spring. This end of the spring doesn't know what the other end is attached to. In fact, as far as the top end of the spring is concerned, it doesn't know what it's attached to either. Does this spring really know that it's attached to a loop of another spring or a ceiling? It doesn't, does it? This spring doesn't know anything at all about this spring. All this spring knows is that it has got a certain bit longer, which means that there is a force pulling down on it that is equal to the Hooke's Law rule. The force pulling down must be the force that extended this spring. Another way to think about it, if you want to, is that up here at the ceiling, the ceiling doesn't know what's attached to it. All it knows is that there's a force pulling it down. Well, if we just assume that the, the springs don't really have any mass, you know, if they're very, very light, and that the bar is very, very light, so that we, we're not really worried too much about any weight contributions from these things, then as far as the ceiling is concerned, someone's just pulling on it with a force F. So there's, the ceiling is in equilibrium. Hopefully it's not breaking. So there must be a force F at the top and a force F at the bottom because otherwise the whole thing wouldn't be in equilibrium. And likewise, this spring is in equilibrium. This spring is neither accelerating upwards nor downwards. So if this spring is being pulled upwards at the top, this spring must be pulled downwards at the bottom by the same force F. And likewise, if this spring is being pulled downwards by a force F, well, that force is being provided by this loop here, and this loop is in equilibrium. So if this loop is being pulled downwards by a force F by this loop, then this loop must be being pulled upwards by a force F by this loop. Otherwise, this bit wouldn't be in equilibrium and the whole thing would be accelerating up and down. Um, and so you can see that we've only got one lot of force throughout this diagram. And here, this force is extending this spring, and then this force is extending this spring, again using Hooke's law. All of these forces are the same, which means we can now write that F from over here is equal to Kx, and F is equal to K1x, but different extension, and f is equal to k2x, different extension. Now, just as a mathematical tip, you're going to start tying yourself in knots a little bit if you start trying to equate three equations together. So if you start writing things like this, you're going to start messing up how to 
manipulate these equations because you don't generally do algebra that has two different equal signs in it because uh, this is really uh, a set of equations rather than a single equation. You can't have two equal signs in a single equation. So please don't adopt that approach. <coughs> what we want to do instead is substitute these into this fourth equation and that will just algebraically stop our head from hurting. So if we just rearrange this one to say that x is f over k and this one is x1 equals f over k1 and this one is x2 equals f over k2 and then we take x, x1 and x2 and sub them into this equation, what we get then is f over k equals f over k1 equal, oops, plus f over k2. And as we said before, it's the same force uh, throughout, and therefore these f's all cancel out, and we find that for springs in series, the spring constants add up indirectly, it's their reciprocals that add up. So if I just summarize that, bring both equations together. So there they are. So this one is parallel and this one is series. You should recognize that pair of equations. It's just there's something slightly odd about them. So my question is, where do you recognize them from and what's the odd thing about them? Feel free to unmute or just tap something onto the chat. It's up to you. Yeah, resistance. And, and what's the odd thing that's going on? Yeah, it is reversed. Oh, Frank is ahead of the game. Um, we'll be playing this game again when we do a topic called capacitance later on, but it looks like Frank already knows stuff. Okay, so let me get rid of those. So yeah, in terms of um, like I said, this holistic nature of physics, we've got uh, resistors R equals R one plus. Oh, do you want capitals? Probably do. That's for resistors in series, springs in parallel. We've got K equals K1 plus K2. The same mathematical form. We've got an, an additive formula and an additive formula. These are called reciprocals, one over. Um, the fact that the series and the parallel are reversed is irrelevant. It's combinations of things are either adding up directly or their inverses are adding up. And Frank is completely correct that we will go on to study uh, something else called capacitors. And when we do study capacitors, we'll meet this pair of formulae again um, when, when we look at how we combine uh, capacitors together in series and parallel arrangements. If you don't know what a capacitor is, you don't need to. Um, we'll get to that next year. Okay.
that's what I wanted to get to today, except I have remembered um, while I was talking that I did forget to note that the spring constant K, um, sometimes people talk about uh, it indicates how stiff the spring is, indicates. Um, so you'll, you'll see that word kind of in revision guides and in textbooks. It refers to um, how flexible an object is, uh, stiffness. So a stiff object isn't very flexible. Um, and so a spring will not be very flexible. It won't be very easy to deform. If it, if it has a high stiffness. So a, a big K means that you need a lot of Newtons in order to achieve an extension of one meter or one centimeter. So uh, a high K means that you need a lot of force to deform the spring, which corresponds to uh, something often referred to as stiffness. So I just I forgot to mention that word earlier on. Okay, everything that we have done today and what you've done for the last two lessons when you were doing um, your investigation, all of that has been about objects. So a spring is an object. It's, it's uh, uh, made of materials and we aren't discussing the material the spring is made of, we're discussing the spring as an object in its own right. Couldn't care less what it's made of. <clears throat> what we're going to do um, in the future is move on to a study of materials themselves rather than uh, the object made of a certain material. So we're heading, but before we're ready to do that, I need you to make sure that you're happy with all things spring-like. So um, in the textbook, um, we've just begun chapter six. Um, and if, you, if you've looked already, then great. But if you haven't looked already, could you open it up at chapter six? There's a PDF on the um, Google Classroom as well. And if you have a look inside chapter six, hang on, I'll see if I can get it up for you. Uh, on the screen. Oops. Okay, so chapter six begins um, with Springs and Hooke's Law, which is what we've just done. So you can work your way through 6.1 now. Um, make sure that everything you read makes sense to you. Um, and towards the end of 6.1, there are some questions for you to do. I, I can't remember how many. My PDF's not loading the um, loading properly in the browser. Um, so I think there are about six questions. Can you just have a go at those questions and see if you can apply Hooke's law and the language that we've been speaking about, the, the, the correct words like tensile deformation, like on the screen in front of you? Just have a go at using the right language to answer those questions. Use the, the formulae. I think there's there's one on springs in series and parallel, so you can have a go at applying these formula as well. And then if you're ready to move on, we'll have a look at what comes next with um, Or if you have hit any problems, I can go through them tomorrow morning with you if you want to. So um, yeah, if you've got a free period today, have a go at those questions. Uh, but for today, I think that'll do and we're done. So 